We're in week number three of our read through the uh, book of Titus, and uh, wow, it's going to be a tough week to read because it's Thanksgiving <laughs> week, a lot of family stuff going on. Yeah, so busy time of year. Just before, you know, the the turkey takes over and you end, off, <laughs> end up in a Thanksgiving Day coma, maybe pick up and read through, uh, through Titus a little bit. Uh, this week three, and we usually spend some time... Uh, thinking about difficult uh, segments of the text, and and one of the realities of Titus is there just aren't a lot of really difficult segments of the text. It's not, it's not a it's tough not Romans, one. It's not Galatians. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We don't even have these big, massive yeah. uh, theological ideas to unpack. But if you look at chapter three, Jeff and I were talking about this. It, it is a great opportunity in chapter 3 to talk about what is at least in our time uh, a controversial point at least or easily misunderstood. Yeah. And and, and and for that reason controversial. Right? Well, <laughs> Fair enough. So uh, this idea that God saves by grace and that men have to do something yeah. is often a bone of contention. And that if you have to do anything, now you're preaching or teaching salvation by works. Yes. Which and is against yes. the gospel. And so even among even among our brothers and sisters today, even among some preachers, you're going to hear some things struggling with this idea about grace and, and works. And if it's by grace, how can we do anything? And it seems to me that there's this little segment of chapter three mm-hmm. that really helps us with that. So you know, grab your Bible and head over to Titus three and let's read uh, beginning in verse four. Mm-hmm. Now, actually, this segment in, in chapter three and verse four is very similar to something that's right above it in chapter two yeah. and verse 11, where we were talking last week about the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation, calling us to be these new kinds of people. And so, and so when he gets to chapter three and verse four, he kind of says the same thing. It sounds very yeah, similar. A little bit different emphasis, but, but he's very much in the same conceptual place. Same vibe going on as my, <laughs> there you as go. my junior high kids yeah, have been saying exactly reading right. reading through this book. That's exactly Josh right. Laughlin was the one who oh, coined the, nice. the, the vibe of the text, and he'll be embarrassed that I said that. So mom and dad, make sure he hears that. So, anyway, <laughs> uh, Titus 3 verse 4, but when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Now, that's kind of yeah. sounded like 211, right? Yep. But he says, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be uh, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so, actually, a lot of pieces that sound a lot like what he said yeah, up in chapter 2. Yeah. But but for our conversation today, dealing with some sub- tough segments in the text, notice we have, we have grace and we have mercy, mm-hmm. but we also have washing, right? So, so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, let's start in verse, uh, verse 4. Um, where he talks about uh, God's love appearing yeah. for us, right. like he talked about in chapter 2 and verse 11. God's grace appeared bringing salvation. Right. God's love appeared for mankind, saving us. Right. So so salvation is the topic. Yeah, salvation is the topic. Um, and, and part of where Paul starts when he talks about this, David, is he's talking about God's, not just God's actions toward us, but God's disposition toward yeah, us. Good and, point. Mm-hmm. And I think that's crucial. I think that's you know part of why the religious world um, misunderstands what it means to be saved by grace as opposed to be saved by works, or you know some of this language that that gets out there is you know uh, often in the Bible when when especially Paul talks about grace, he's talking about God's disposition towards us. Mm-hmm. You know, in other words, and because the word grace, like so many other religious words has baggage, cultural and religious baggage now, faith, love, you know, a lot of these words have baggage now because they've been used and abused and misunderstood in the culture and in the religious world. Um, you know, the word I like to use for grace anymore is favor. Um, the idea is that, you know, God is favorably disposed toward us. Mm-hmm. Why does God save us when he didn't have to? Grace, mercy, 
goodness, love. The mm-hmm. idea is that he is well disposed toward us. That's his attitude toward us. He wants to. He wants to. Yes. He because he created us, you know, he's invested in us. He does not he wants to he still wants to see the purpose for which he created us accomplished even though we have fallen. It's kind of, it's kind of like we all are with our kids, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you and I both own people who just had kids that were rotten. I yeah. mean, just not good human beings just turned out bad and yet mom and dad still love them that's right and want very much uh to save them i'm not using that in the sense of the text here but to save them from themselves to save them from their mess and would happily do whatever they could to accomplish that yeah yeah and that's very much you know that's very much i think the, the 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 big picture of what paul's starting to sketch here is that, you know, and again, you know, we take it for granted now, but in the ancient world where, you know, you think about the myths and the legends and the stories of the Greeks and the Romans, you know, the gods were not good. The gods, you know, you had to tap dance around and be careful not to hack off a god or make a god angry with you, lest, you know, like Odysseus, you get banished from home. You know, you, you know right. they get in your way of getting home. I mean, you know, they, they do bad things to you. And so part of what Paul's had to say is, listen, this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this not one like true that. God, he's not like that. He's on your side, actually. Right. He's on your side. And so he's cheering for you. He wants you to do the correct. right thing. And so that's the whole idea is that at the end of the day, the real dichotomy, like when Paul says in verse five, then that he saved us not because of works. Okay, I wanted you to get to that yeah. and comment on that yeah. because because that's where we start having some confusion. It's, it's not about your works. So once you know, once he sketched the idea that, you know, that that all of this starts from God's good disposition toward us, um, that He really is on our side, that He wants to see us live. He he wants to see us saved. He wants to see us recovered in the relationship with him. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness. And again, think about the pagan mindset. You have to appease the gods. You have to manipulate the gods with some sacrifices, you know, or, or, or whatever. The idea that once I have ruptured my relationship with God through sin, there is anything, even good things, I can do that will in some way atone for the sin, repair the rupture between me and God. God. Even if they're righteous, even if they're things that God commands us, says, I like this, or even the things in the law, that, you know, Old Testament or New Testament, that God says, I want you to do this. Worship, for instance, that's not going to fix the fundamental right. rupture. That's right. what Paul means when he says works of righteousness will not save you. You cannot do enough good things, even God commanded things, to fix the rupture of sin. By, by the way, emphasizing what a big deal sin really is. Because I think part of our struggle with understanding this is our culture just gets in us and we just minimize sin. We don't see what a big deal it is. And this is what you're saying is underscoring this. That's right. Because again, in our culture, we define ourselves as victims of what others have done to us or haven't done for us. Or, you know, I'm a victim of my upbringing. We we have removed the individual moral agency, moral responsibility from people anymore if they have in any way been mistreated or had some sort of misfortune or, or mistreatment in their life. God doesn't look at it that way. Um, you know, all of us are morally responsible. And once I have sinned, it is a serious business. And no amount of what has been done to me or no amount of good deeds on my part will fix the fundamental rupture. Humanity even if it never sinned again, individually or collectively, there is no way to undo the cost of sin. And so that's what Paul is uh, gets at. He saved us not because of the works done by us. And so we didn't earn it. We didn't find a way to say, oh, you know what? If we do this right deed, if we do this act of righteousness or enough of these acts of righteousness, God will save us or we can go to heaven. Right. No, Paul says, there's nothing that we can do. But according to his own mercy. Okay, don't, don't go, don't, don't, don't too, go too quickly past that word because, thank heaven, the next word is but. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because if <laughs> there was right. a period of that sin, end of that sentence, we would be without hope. That's right. No, that's we exactly can't, right. We can't fix this ourselves. We cannot fix this. But. But. And again, now we're back to a disposition word. According to his, his own mercy. mercy. He like he would rather show mercy than condemn us. That's the nature of God. And so this is as much disposition that leads to act, but it's disposition. He wants to show mercy rather than condemnation. And so, by the washing of regeneration okay. and renewal of the Holy Spirit, now we're getting down the brass tacks, right? Washing of regeneration. Yeah. Fancy word for baptism. Well, and, and 
it's difficult to imagine what else that would be. Right. Now, now the washing part isn't surprise, right? Yeah. Because because washing threads through the whole story from Genesis to the end, right? Right. But um, but in the New Testament, mm-hmm. the washing is baptism. Yeah. And if that isn't what it is, it's hard to know what that is. Well, that's right. You know, then you're into some sort of we have no idea. But but there's just within the larger thought world of the New Testament, as we read, you know, clearly from everything from examples in the Book of Acts, right. Starting with Peter's response in the Day of Pentecost when he's asked, "What do we do in response to this message about God raising Jesus from the dead as the crucified Messiah? How do we respond to the facts of that?" We accept those. It's repentance and baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And so, and then the other statements that we've read with Paul this year and some of his other letters. Yeah, I agree. The thought world leaves us with no other reasonable conclusion but that he's talking about. I think a washing of regeneration. That's where, you know, think about the other things Paul's talked about. You know, um, you know, being buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. A regeneration. That's right. what baptism does. Yeah. So it even fits with other things that we've seen Paul say this year. It's just a, you know, a different word, a different way of phrasing it, but that's what happens. Renewing by the Holy Spirit, because yeah. He pairs those two together. Yeah, absolutely. So, so whenever people bring the Holy Spirit into the conversion process, it's often in an effort to make this some kind of mystical yeah. work of the Spirit. I don't think we need to mystify the work of the Spirit. No, that's I don't think right. it needs to be a puzzle to us. No, that's right. You know, this is not, you know, we, of course, we've seen a lot of other spirit language in Paul this year, too, right? Because right. We, you know, we're, we're at the end of reading all these letters. Yeah, and so Paul is not teaching, you know, here or anywhere else in his letters, you know, what a lot of people want to find in this phrase today, which is that you have some sort of personal experience of the Holy Spirit, you know, where either the Holy Spirit illumines you so that you understand what the Bible really means or... Or, or in some way guides you, you know, mystically, or you know, kind of the old joke about you whispering in your ear or something, mm-hmm. who you should marry or what job you should take, or a gut or feeling. I just get this feeling. this impulse that this yeah. is what I'm supposed to do or how it's supposed to be. People talk a lot about that yeah. and attribute that to the spirit. Yeah, that's right. But at the end of the day, you know, this is there's nothing new here in terms of you know going either way, even back to Acts chapter two when Paul talk or uh, uh, Peter talks about, you know, when he says repent and be baptized, forgive your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, that, that this is just the same old, you know, the Spirit is at work in this process, and, you know, he is revealing it. Uh, he's inspired the apostles, um, you, know, you know. Bringing this message. Bringing this message. That forms us in the image of Jesus. Bringing this message. You know, and then at the end of the day, as Paul has even talked about elsewhere, just as the Spirit raised Jesus from the dead, the end result of all this is what? You get raised, you know, the, the real salvation is resurrection from the right. dead anyways at the end of time. And so, yeah, this is not some sort of mystical, personal experience where the Spirit is now going to actively intervene in your life. It's, it's, well, what I want to say is an aside to that. I don't, I don't want to go too far down this trail. Sure. In fact, I'm, I'm worried I'm going to bait you down this trail, okay. and I'm trying not I'll, I'll to try, do that. I'll try not to go there, but, uh, <laughs> wherever we're headed. Whenever somebody goes that direction with the Spirit, it also almost always ends up taking them away from what the Spirit revealed no, no, in Scripture. No, that's exactly and that's, right. that's the concern that that it ends up becoming a way not to do what the Spirit said yeah. or to get around something that the Spirit said. I think we need to be really, really cautious about that because whatever somebody believes about the Spirit, he's certainly going to act consistently with the message that he gave. No, that's exactly and so, right. And so when, when I get an impulse that I think is from the Spirit— if it's in conflict with what he said, then I'm misreading that. That's well, not an impulse from the, the Spirit. And the classic examples, for instance, somebody who has no right to remarriage, right. who believes that the Spirit is guiding them to this wonderful Christian person. It's not their fault they were divorced. It's not their fault they didn't know better when they married the first time, but now they do. And so the Spirit is guiding them that this is okay and this is God's will that they remarry this new Christian somebody in their life. You know, and so it's just going to all be for the glory of God. No. Right. And, and, and I agree with you, David, just as a quick sidebar, it's fascinating. You know, one of the other passages in Paul that people 
love to use as teaching that the Spirit does this in us. You know, first uh, first Corinthians chapter two, where Paul talks about things being spiritually discerned. You know, and so the idea is that the Holy Spirit's teaching you what to discern. If that's what Paul meant, then I need someone to explain to me why in that same letter Paul has to explain to them the, why they are why they need to stop abusing spiritual gifts. Think about it. We we never draw that line. If that's what if Paul is saying, the Spirit is illuminating you and guiding you to all this. Then why have they made such a mess of their own spiritual <laughs> right. gifts in Corinth? I, I nobody's ever answered that for me. So so here's the interesting thing. When you go on in six and seven, because because he's talking about uh, he's talking about baptism mm-hmm. in five. Mm-hmm. He goes on to say in six about the Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So here's the interesting thing that he goes on mm-hmm. to wrap back Jesus into this mm-hmm. and what he does mm-hmm. and to talk about grace. Yeah. And so the intriguing thing to me is that, uh, for example, baptism that people often describe for a, as a work and say, that, well, therefore, you, you, you can't say that baptism is necessary for salvation. Paul puts that all together in this context. Agreed. He puts mercy and grace together with things that we do, our response to God, including a reference to baptism. Well, and, and along that line, David, what he's really doing in verse 7 is he's he's using different words, but he's he's ending with the same sentiment, the same idea that he started with, right? In verse 4. So in verse 4, he starts with the goodness and the loving kindness of our God, and then he's ending with so being justified by his grace. And it's the same idea. At the end of the day, all this is because of God's good disposition toward us, that through God, and again, even with God's grace, God still had to do something. Jesus Jesus had to die. And so, because sin had to be atoned for, had to be right. dealt with in some way. And so, yes, God did the work that achieves the atonement of salvation, or uh, the atonement of sin, that makes salvation possible, because sin had to be dealt with. But at the end of the day, why is God doing any of this? That's what grace is. Grace is not the absence of works. It's disposition grace, toward us. Grace is the reason the works are happening. Right. Why God does what he does toward us, and then why we should reach back in the responses that God has established as the responses he wants to right. his gracious works. Yep. And so, you know, just like we talk about faith works, grace works in the sense, I mean, God, out of his good disposition, his favor toward us, right. he worked on our behalf and now intends for us to respond in like fashion. And, you know, he acts out of the nature that he has toward us. He wants us to, to fix our nature, so to speak, to become the right kind of people that does rightly respond back to him. So I think... Um I think one of the things you can do as you're reading through Titus again this week is uh, is to read through this segment and notice how all those things are blended together. This disposition of God toward us, his love for us, mm-hmm. his grace toward us, his mercy toward us, his goodness toward us, blended with our response to him, yeah. uh, our response in baptism, but as well, our response in a godly life, our response in good works. Right. That's all blended together as we work through this segment of the letter. So That's while right. people try to separate those things out, as you read, notice the beauty of how God weaves them together in, uh, in this letter he inspired Paul to write. Good thing to ponder as you spend some time reading through Titus this week.